Welcome to Access to Justice. I'm your host, Heather Mallorick of Merrick Law. My co-host is Evan Clark of Kahane Law. Hey, Evan, how are you doing? Hey, Heather, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. You know, I'm kind of riding the waves of Edmonton weather this last week. I think we went from minus 37 to plus two, back down to minus 27, and our I don't even know what's going on out there today, but they were calling for rain. So I feel like I'm on some sort of roller coaster, but doing well other than the migraines. So (laughs) luckily it didn't rain because, yeah, they were saying it was going to rain this morning. And um, last night on my way home from work, when it was one of our minus, well, it was only minus 17 swings. Um, I'm driving along, okay, like this, you know. Mm With, you move the wheel like that when you drive. As you do, Evan's kind of moving each arm up and down yeah. like a cartoon and, driver. <laughs> and it's this little road in Edmonton, and a lot of the little roads are, are 40 kilometers an hour now. And um, so I'm not going very fast right after I turned onto the road, but it's kind of a busy road that goes between two thoroughfares. This guy, all of a sudden, in the other lane going the other way, pulls out right in front of me. Oh, no. And I'm like, I hit the brakes. I don't want to talk about exactly what happened for insurance purposes, but um, I managed to avoid hitting him, like he- slamming right into him by my deft maneuvering abilities. And it was more like a scrape. But I was very annoyed at this guy. Um... And then he, and then he was like, "Hey, it's gonna be your fault, eh?" I'm like, "What?" You literally pulled into my lane. He's like, yeah, but you hit me. I'm like, what? I'm like, anyways, that's what the insurance is for, buddy. Don't worry about it. Mm, yeah, exactly. Well, let's maybe prescient a little bit with our topic today. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so segue. yeah, we're also joined by our very special guest, Kim McDonald of McDonald Advisory. Kim's a financial advisor and insurance advisor with Raymond James Limited. Hi, Kim. How are you? Hi, Heather. Hi, Evan. Evan, sorry to hear about your little nick there. That's that can be annoying. Um, hopefully, it, it works out for you, but. If it doesn't, that's life. Life is hard. <laughs> life is hard indeed. Feel it every day. Feel it every day. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. I appreciate it. <laughs> but we're here for moral support. And uh, maybe one of our future episodes, we'll get a general insurance person on. Um, and our guest today can probably explain to us the difference between different insurance people, uh, just for our listeners, because nobody seems to know that. But uh, I, I'll stop blabbering along so we can get our guest on. I'm really excited because today's a money day, a financial day, which always makes me happy on our program because I, I have a little bit more uh, uh, things to say. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, without further ado, then let me introduce today's guest. Um, we're pleased to welcome Dave Horlick to the podcast today. Dave is a certified financial planner with Capital Edge Financial in Edmonton, and he's been working in the industry for 21 years, which seems hard to believe looking at you. You look very young, Dave. Welcome you. to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um Looking forward to, uh, yeah, sharing some wisdom with respect to group benefits and all that fun stuff, but thanks for having me. Fantastic. We can't wait to get into it. So, um, Kim, do you want to take the reins today? Do you want to start firing some rapid rapid fire questions at Dave. Yeah, I think there's a lot for people to learn today. You know, everybody, most people out there have been in a situation where they're about to get hired by a company and the company gives them a big stack of of contracts from annoying lawyers and then a big stack from uh, group benefits people. And they're supposed to make sense of all this stuff, uh, not being a lawyer, not being a benefits consultant. So Mm -hmm. uh, today on the program, I think we're going to 
to dig into what are benefits, what are the components of it, what's important. Um, and, uh, and I just can't wait to get into this because there was a, a, a time when I was, I started on the wealth side, the money side, not insurance. And I was frightened by group benefits booklets. So <laughs> it took a while to get up to speed. And uh, Dave, Dave today is, is the expert in the area. So we're going to grill them and get a whole pile of information. So uh, yeah. Dave, Dave, to start this off, are there different insurance people are out there? Can can I come to you for house and auto insurance or what? Like, what do you do? And tell us about your licensing. Okay. So that's a great question. Um, uh, yeah. So as far as the insurance planning, uh, I am a certified financial planner, which means I don't deal with the car insurance, the house insurance, liability insurance, um, but rather more so specialized into insurance, uh, life insurance, disability insurance, critical illness. And then we also deal with group benefits. So your health and dental benefits on the personal side, as well as for small groups, large, com large companies. We also deal with retirement planning, but my true passion is dealing with business owners and helping them navigate the mystery of insurance, like you said, and trying to figure, okay, how do we get to my financial goal? And what's the most tax efficient way of doing that? So tax efficient, they love that word. Yeah. I know. And it, there's, th this is a recent model that we've come up with, but a lot of people have a bad association with working harder. Like you got to work hard and, and not or work smart, not hard, but I would like to take the approach of plan smarter. So we need to plan, not just like, okay, where is the goal, but we need to do it in a more tax efficient way um, and making sure that we're making our money work for us and not wow. spending money unnecessarily. So that's where we come into play as far as helping small business owners try and make sense of it all. So we're very much working for the business owner but we also deal with the different insurance companies, the different investment companies. So we're very much a broker. They work for us. We work for you. Huh. Hmm. Huh. Well, that's really interesting because I mean, I've, I've been an employee and an employer before, and um, this was pretty mystifying for me in both roles. <laughs> so I'm really excited to uh, ask uh, some questions and find out some more about this today. Um, so where, I guess, maybe can you fill us in maybe on some of the basics? Are there like some just usual health and dental benefits that that are in place or available for employers and employees? Yes. Um, and I think Kim very much hit it on the head when she said, when you first start with an employer, the owner or the HR department, department throws you a benefit booklet and says, here you go. Um, here's your drug card. Um, let us know if you have any questions and that's very much it. Yeah. So for employers, there's a lot of confusion. They know maybe what their parents have told them, but as far as the basics, health and dental, that's what everyone wants, which is what most group benefits plan have. It's when you get into the details and read the booklet, as far as how much life insurance do I have? What's the disability? Um, is there paramedical coverage? So can I get my massage therapy, physiotherapy, are acupuncture is covered? So all those little details, which are normally outlined in the first couple pages of a benefit booklet. But a lot of times people are not aware of if there's a health spending account, um, what about the app, like if it's with an insurance company, most of the insurance companies are moving towards either a paperless or a uh, no drug card. So an electronic drug card to cover those expenses. So it's very, it's moving more so towards a digital age. So you're not seeing any paperwork and you're not getting physical checks back. It's more electronic. That, so, that must be nice. I, I get coverage through as, as a, you know, someone who's self-employed getting insurance for myself, it, I looked at doing, but because I don't have any insurance right now and I'm a reservist in the military, I get some pretty good coverage under the military for specifically their dental and they're administered by normal big insurance companies, Sun Life and Canada Life. 
for insurance, for dentistry. Not only does it have to be a hard copy paper, it's got to be like filled out by the provider and then I got to take it to my orderly room and they have to stamp it and then I submit it. So leave it to the government to find a way to cling on to paper for as long as possible. But it's nice to hear that everyone else is switching to digital. And can I just say this? This is a big pet peeve of mine. When people say, I don't like insure, uh, insert insurance company name here. I don't like Blue Cross. I don't like Canada Life because they had crappy coverage. It's not the insurance company. Mm. It's because you had a crappy employer that was chintzing out on the vision care or they had crazy deductibles, which prohibited you, you from using the plan. So it's not the insurance company was bad. It was just more so the empo- employer put together a really crappy plan design. That's exactly what I wanted to get into first. The, the employer calls up a benefits company and says, I need benefits. Come out and tell me about what you got. And I think people would get a lot out of you explaining what that meeting looks like with an insurance person and an employer choosing the benefits for their employees. Is that something that you can uh, talk about, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, like the nerve just popped out of my head right now because employers will say, okay, show me some different options. And they look at the side-by-side comparisons and it will show insurance company X. That's the cheapest. So, okay, awesome. Let's go with that company. But what employees don't know is that the rates are determined based on the employees, the, the combined total um, claims experience. So I don't want to get too technical, but if all the employees are claiming the crap out of dental and the premiums are very minimal, guess what's going to happen to the rates next year? Oh, the insurance. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the insurance You're going to go up. Yeah. I mean, it's not insurance companies are not charities. They are profit companies. So for the employer, they have to ask themselves, is the employer looking to provide a value added service or they're looking to protect their employees with a nice benefit plan to give them peace of mind so that they can sleep easy at night knowing that hey if i get a hockey puck to the mouth and i need to get some major dental work done my group benefits plan is going to cover that or heaven forbid my spouse gets diagnosed with cancer and i need to make a critical illness claim Um, is my employer's group benefit plan going to cover that are they looking to provide value and peace of mind to the employees or is that employer looking for some insurance company to take advantage because we want to rack up as much massage therapy and physiotherapy and use the crap out of it and then go to a different insurance company the next year. So that's the biggest thing is what's the objective of that employer? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so they get, a menu, they get a, essentially a menu from you guys that says, okay, do you want... Well, well, everybody has to take life insurance, but do you want disability? Do you want uh, how much dental, how much prescriptions, how much massage and acupuncture? Do you want, you know, to boost it up with some critical illness, which is awesome. Um, so, so like, do you, do you just put out a menu and they, they pick from it and you say, this is what it costs and they try and fit it into their budget. Is that how that goes? Yeah. Usually like there's a very, a basic formula for a a group benefit plan. So health, dental, um, like you said, life insurance is mandatory, but there's a very basic plan. And I always say your first car is in the Porsche. So don't worry about the orthodontics and the bells and the whistles start out basic. It's a lot easier to add on, but, um, get the employees used to it at the beginning. And then we can certainly add on in the future, but, um, Yeah. And trying to find that balance where, like I said, you're providing value to the employee. And one of the the interesting trends with some of the insurance companies is that the insurance companies are recognizing that healthy employers, employees are not going to be using as as much drug coverage. So they're trying to promote healthy living with things like um, encouraging Uh, fitness and meditation and they will reward you with gift cards to Starbucks or Tim Hortons um, if you participate in their their uh, healthy living program so they want you to be more active so you're not 
becoming a diabetic and incurring more uh, expenses that way. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting trend where they're they're being proactive rather than reactive in, in treating the illness. Um, I guess I have a question about how employers can determine the needs or the wants of their employees. I'm going to assume most employers want happy employees and they want them to be happy with their benefits package, um, but also have a budget in mind. Um, So like, is there... I've heard a lot of talk about, you know, employers going towards, like you said, wellness spending plans or health spending plans and maybe away from a more structured, here's a specific amount for a category for drugs or dental or those other paramedical expenses, I guess. Is there there a good way for an employer to figure out what their employees want or need? It's very much... uh a very difficult situation where if the employer was to ask the employees, it's going to be a no win situation because Uh um, a single gentleman in his twenties is going to want to have as much massage therapy, whereas a family is going to want to have orthodontics. So to try and get a poll, it's good to get a poll depending on the size of the company, but if there's a hundred employees, you're not going to have a very good consensus. So Uh A basic package is good. Mm -hmm. Um, And then if the employees start to max out on everything, then we can certainly add. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I I think the the trend is definitely more towards that health spending account strategy where the the idea is the employer is giving you X amount of dollars, for example, $1,000 per year to use on whatever kind of expenses that might not be covered by the insurance plan. So Say, for example, orthodontics, laser eye surgery, um, any excess above and beyond the insurance coverage for paramedical services, that amount can be used however the employee wants. So it's a good strategy of insurance as a foundation and then a top up with that health spending account to cover any kind of extraordinary expenses or um, customizing to each employee. So is that yeah. like a, is that like a private health services plan? I've heard it called yeah. that before. Okay. Yeah. It's like same, same okay. idea. Yeah. I've often, I've often wondered since I learned about private health services plans back in another life a long time ago, I've often wondered why don't people just do that instead of insurance? But I think it comes down to this one thing, depending on, you mentioned a few things. Uh, you talked about, like the plan for what coverage, like how they craft the plan. And um, I think the benefit with insurance, from my understanding, is you lower the cost of things by being in a large pool of people that have different needs so that then the insurance company can still make money and you can pay less than what you're spending on annual health needs or maybe more because you're the person funding the people that are spending less. But um, so can you talk a little bit about like, it seems, it seems to me that in the benefit plans I've been a part of kind of throw you 200, $300 bones spread across a whole bunch of different services that you're not going to use all of them. Right. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about like that planning of the coverage that an employer can do? And that that's exactly it. So essentially they're taking a large pool of employees that have a commonality of working for an employer. So there is no anti-selection because if everyone in that company has to join the plan, there are no medical questions, but yeah, the insurance company is going to reduce their risk by saying, okay, well, we're going to provide you up to $500 for hearing aids, or we're going to provide up to a hundred dollars per massage for, for one hours of massage. So they are reducing their risk that way as well. But yeah, the the idea is not to max out every single component on a group benefit plan. Like whatever you need, then go ahead and take it. But just because you have, and and (laughs) it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine as well. When you see dentists advertising and saying at the end of the year, have you maxed out your dental? Well, come on in for teeth whitening or something like that or, or Jerks. So, yeah. Um, mm. So just because you haven't have it doesn't mean that you have to use it. That's how they're they're spreading the risk and uh, 
Yeah, making sure that they're making a profit as well. Doesn't that go back to your claims experience thing? Like the yeah. more you use the plan, the more it's going to cost in the future. So if everybody's using the heck out of the plan on stuff they don't really need, your premiums are going to go up as a as a whole. Is that is that correct, Dave? Yeah, and just because I have car insurance doesn't mean that I have to go like smash my car up. Like there's, <laughs> there's yeah, a price Dave, to pay. Sorry, if Evan. Not, if it's not your fault, <laughs> then it doesn't affect your insurance premium. <laughs> there's no such thing. There's no such equivalent in health insurance. Yeah. But you can definitely tell like with the smaller companies where there's not as big of a pool and all of a sudden there, it, it, it doesn't take much for one employee to make a difference and they're using the heck out of it. And all of a sudden the claims experience um, goes through the roof and the insurance company has to increase the premium because that um, they're trying to make a profit off of it as well. So. So is there a way, is there some, I know like, well, I guess I should answer the question, answer, ask the question first and then I'll qualify. I, is there some way to become like a member of a larger pool than your company, especially if you're a small company? I know some places like, um, or some organizations like, um, oh, what are, what are they Chamber called? Of, Chamber of Commerce? Yeah, Chamber of Commerce. Chamber, I know Chamber of Commerce, Chambers of Commerce um, offer those types of um offer the ability for employers to kind of jump in on their plan, which of course makes the pool much bigger, especially if it's a bigger chain, chamber of commerce. But outside of chambers of commerce, is there any other kind of uh, sweet hacks you have for getting um, becoming a larger pool? There are definitely associations. So um, say, for example, you might be part of a, a lawyer's association or an accountant's association where you can definitely piggyback on their group benefit plan. Definitely advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are you're part of a bigger pool. So if you have one employee that's on a super bio drug that costs $10,000 a month, it's not going to go against your claims experience. But the disadvantages, you don't necessarily have the same flexibility in the plan design. And then also their limits tend to be a little bit lower so that they can control their costs as well. So you might not get the entire amount covered. When you so. say limits, what do you mean by that? So like the annual limit um, for your dental or for your drugs, um, if you have an employee, like literally this week, um, a rheumatoid arthritis drug costs about $4,000 per month. And they're spending about 20, I think it was about $25,000 per year on this one drug. Um, so that's not going to be covered fully with an association plan. Um, you might see $2,500 or $5,000 for an association plan, but um, you don't have that same flexibility. That's how they control their risks. Hmm. So it's very much a numbers game with insurance companies. Like they're just looking at as far as pure numbers and risks. So if we have a group of mechanics that are like just maxing out and everything, well, they're gonna pay a higher premium compared to the lawyers that, that don't, the young the lawyers that don't have any expenses, so. This is, this is my perception and it might be other people's perception as well. So I want to give you the chance to debunk this perception or validate it. Um, <clears throat> so when I was, when I was an employee paying insurance, I think my monthly contributions were, were around $200, maybe a little bit less. And my employers were the same. So I was paying somewhere around 24 or a total, I guess it was somewhere around um, 4,000 a year. I was not coming anywhere close to claiming $4,000 worth of medical expenses. In fact, it would have been very challenging to do that under that plan. Cause it was again, like 300 bucks for acupuncture, 300 bucks for chiropractic, you know, uh, a little bit more for dentists, but it was like, I don't, I don't even know if I could have possibly claimed $4,000. What? Like, that seems like, uh, not a good deal. It's a little steep. Yeah, for sure. And just to clarify, like, were you as a single employee or were you a family? Uh, that didn't change the premium. I was on, like, I have, uh, I think it was the same, but yeah, I, I have five kids. So we were all on there. My yeah. wife and I and the five kids, but I think it was the same for everybody. And, um, it, they might've been on the chamber of commerce plan. I'm not sure, but yeah. I, yeah. So <laughs> Uh, to answer that question, yeah, like it depends on what 
is on that group benefit plan. So if there's like disability, short-term, long-term disability, those can definitely add some major premium. There might've been, there might've, I think there probably was some disability insurance on there. Yeah. And, um, disability can be insurance or can be expensive. Um, all it takes is one claim and all of a sudden you're on disability for 20 years and say a, a salary of $3,000 per month for 20 years, that can definitely add up as far as like a major expense for the insurance company. So disability can certainly increase that premium. And then unfortunately, if, if the average annual premium is $4,000, there are employees on that association plan that are exceeding the $4,000 per month. And you're on the, the bottom end as far as claims for that. So <laughs> There's some that are exceeding that, and there's those that are supplementing or subsidizing those that don't have that amount in premiums. Yeah, I don't know. Is that? I see that different, Evan. That's a great deal because what if you do go on disability for 20 years? All you paid was four grand a month for a few years, and then you got coverage for disability forever. Four, four, four grand a year. Yeah, but I didn't pay it. Like I was only paying a portion of that, right? I was paying like I don't know, 180 or 200 a month. Yeah. Oh, well, and that's that's why I wanted to bring it up because like why am I paying that? It didn't make sense to me. Right. And then I'm like, well, why wouldn't you just do the whole thing be a spending account? Cause then at least you can get 100% of what you want of something covered instead of like a little bit here, a little bit there it started to seem like not a great deal. And that's exactly it. So if, if you just want to have um, a tax efficient way of paying for your health and dental massage therapy, a health spending account is perfect. But if you do have a car accident or if you slip and fall off the, uh, the ladder hanging the Christmas lights and you're disabled, health spending account's not going to go that far. So well, you have to get disability insurance, which I think right. we can talk a lot about. Or, or if you end up with rheumatoid arthritis, like you mentioned in yeah. that example, if you've got a health spending account that gives you even $4,000 a year, that's great, but that's not going to cover the cost of that drug. So yeah, it's more, I guess I'm maybe just through our conversation coming to realize that benefits, it's actually more like insurance. <laughs> and I think you've been saying that all along, but I think that's <laughs> actually sinking in now that it's actually a form of insurance and not so much a, a benefit, I guess, in a way. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think, um, the driving point is if you're looking at it from the mindset of I put in $200, I want to get at least 200 plus dollars of expenses paid back towards me. That's not the best way to look at it. It's, it's more so peace of mind knowing, Hey, if I die on the Anthony handy today, my wife is going to be covered for, you know, X amount of dollars for life insurance. Or if I get sick or if I get ill, um, all those types of things, or if I need like in home nursing, those different things are going to help. But the idea is not to max out on your massage therapy or your acupuncture per year. It's, it's peace of mind. Yeah. And look, I don't want to, um, you know, put you in the grinder there on that one. <laughs> I know it's like a specific example I use without providing all of the facts because we can't look at the policy. So it's not exactly the most fair thing to do, but I appreciate you, uh, answering it and Kim. And I'll, yeah. I didn't even think, honestly, I didn't even think about the disability portion. I was just thinking about the health benefits and it makes a lot of sense. Disability insurance is not a cheap insurance. Yeah. And it's surprising. Like the people that need insurance the most are the ones that can't get it. So the, the, the guy that has terminal cancer, he really wants to get life insurance. You can't get it. So, um, this is one of the perks of a group benefit plan is they're spreading the risk over a large number of employees and everyone can sign up for it. Which is kind of funny because if you have cancer, you've got a terminal. If you have a terminal cancer, you're going to die, but we're all going to die. Try to I set up the be life a insurance before you're given that terminal diagnosis though. That's my yeah, <laughs> word yeah. of advice. Yeah, I'm, I'm insured. I'm insured. So, so Evan brought up a point about um, the cost as a single person versus a couple versus a family. Is there, Dave, tell us the difference between, roughly, the difference between somebody who's just by themselves signing up for a company group benefits plan versus a family who has dependents and whatnot. 
So insurance companies have um, different rates depending on if you're single, if you're a family, and some of them do offer couple rates, but um, that really depends on the employer if they'll allow that. Most 95% of employers will have a single family couple rate. Family is a husband, wife, and it could be two kids or 10 kids. Um, family rate is one set rate and a single rate is just a single person, but um, they try and uh, make it equal for everyone in that sense. And then a couple is just basically a husband, wife or husband, or sorry, a parent and a single child, but that's basically how they determine the rates. And is there like a range of costs that people would kind of expect, like from a big insurance company working at a big company? Uh, what would you say it costs for a single person versus a family? It all depends. Um, like a general rate is a family rate will be 2.3 times a single rate. But I mean, it, it depends on the size of the group, the ages of the employees. <laughs> Everything is all determined by the insurance company and uh, not to get too technical again, but like one insurance company might have really good experience with, I don't know, legal firms. Another insurance company has really good experience with mechanic shops. Um, and that's why we shop it out with different insurance companies, just to make sure that the employer is getting the best rate. So that's where the broker comes into play. <laughs> So you could go to Sun Life or Canada Life or whoever Blue else. Out there. Yeah. And say, yeah. hey, I got this company. Here's what they want, X, Y, and Z. What are you going to give me? Yeah. Right. Now, if they're competing, like, are you just going to pick the lowest cost or what? What do you do? It, um, it's not always dependent on cost, but it also depends on the service from that, that provider as well. Mm -hmm. So we as brokers or my office, we don't want to set up uh, a company that has an insurance company that has horrible claims experience, or we know that they're going to have troubles with claims or that there's going to be questions when it comes to a disability claims. Like we don't want to put that client of ours in that kind of position. So we will definitely guide them towards insurance companies that we prefer. Um, but we tend not to quote on companies that are a little bit, um, I don't want to say sketchy, but that aren't as reputable when it comes to their claims paying ability. So we want to make sure it's not only just a good price, but also good service from the insurance company. And on the vein of shopping around, I, I wanted to uh, come back to plan design. How, how flexible are the different companies in plan design? Uh, um, when I was looking at just as like um, buying my own insurance for my family, not necessarily through an employer, uh, it looked like there was option A and option B. Is there more flexibility when you're an employer looking to set something up like that, Dave? Yeah. I mean, we can customize it however you want. And truth be told, like based on our experience, like most insurance companies can have an apples to apples comparison. Like if we really want it, we can make it the same or make it look the same. Um, that's really up to the broker to go into the details of the plan. But um, yeah, most insurance companies, the major insurance companies will have very comparable plan designs. The differences will lie in the, the extras or the features that they might have. So like I mentioned, um, the healthy lifestyle rewards program that an insurance company where they'll try and encourage, uh, the employees to be healthier and they reward with points and then they'll provide gift cards and whatnot. Those are the different extras where the insurance company is trying to have a competitive edge over their competition. So, yeah. So, but, but you can, you can, as a broker, you can help craft, craft a totally bespoke tailor-made. Yeah, for sure. And that's the fun part. Like, we'll like usually on an annual basis, we'll take a look at the claims experience. Okay. You guys haven't used the $2,500 of, of dental that you have in the plan. Like why don't we scale that down and reduce your premium a little bit or, Hey, your employees are maxing out on your paramedical services, like your massage and acupuncture. Let's top that up. And, and just, it's a work in progress as far as trying to find a, a good balance between cost and, and benefit. Mm -hmm. So. I guess that's one way that employers get feedback then on what, maybe not what they, their employees want, but certainly what they've been using then throughout the previous year when it comes time to renew those benefits or look at the package. Yeah. And, and like our office will, sorry, we'll send out quarterly statements. 
So there aren't any surprises at the year end saying like, Hey, you guys have used like a ton of drug coverage. You've like, whatever you haven't used the dental. So there are no surprises when it comes to the renewal time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would think as an employer, like as a practical consideration, you'd want to be careful before removing something because I think Dave touched on a really important aspect of insurance. Insurance tends to be a peace of mind type of thing. And so maybe people are like really pumped about having, but they feel very comforted by having a certain thing on the plan, even though they don't use it. Yeah. I don't know. Do you see that play out Dave? Yeah. And, and totally like when setting up the plan, I will always tell the, the, the owner start out basic. Like your first car is not a Porsche or a Ferrari. So let's add in the future versus, Hey, let's have an orthodontics and let's max everything out. When you start to take those benefits away, the employees look at that as a demotion. Mm. So mm. It, it's, it's a lot easier to add, like I said, and also for the employer to have um, some kind of employee contribution. So the employee can, or sorry, the, the employer can definitely pay for the entire premium, but the employee should have some skin in the game as far as like what they're getting. And if the premiums do increase, to make sure that um, they experience those increases as well. Right. Cause then they, then they can be more, it, it can be more palatable to them to lose the orthodontic coverage if they're paying less. Is that the idea? Say that again. So it can be more palatable to the employee to lose a benefit. If it means they're going to pay less uh, of a premium. Is that the idea of having them participate in the payments? If say, for example, yeah, like if um, there's been a lot of usage and the entire group is using the heck out of it, well, obviously the employee should also experience an increase in premium if the uh, the, uh, the rates go up next year. So you want to make sure that, like I said, they're, they're having some kind of premium or some contribution to the plan. Um, the other thing too is if say, for example, the employer is paying for 100%, sometimes the employee doesn't even know that they have a group benefit plan and they won't use it at all. Or sometimes the complete opposite where, Hey, I'm just going to max out on everything. Cause I don't care. My employer is paying for everything. What do I care if the rates go up? So it's almost like the two extreme where like they don't use it at all. Cause they don't know what they have it or they max it out. Hmm. Uh, I wonder if you've ever seen this, this, this again, I'm using the Canadian forces plan, which is a public health services plan or something like that. So it's not just the forces, other people have it too. It's the government, it's the federal government. They're, the way they're set up is really weird. So I have to play, the, I have to pay the employee portion, which is really small. It's like five bucks a month or something like that. And I have to pay the employer portion as well. And then I have to submit a claim in February and they reimburse me the employer portion. Have you ever? <laughs> <laughs> <What? No. laughs> Yeah, that's what they, that's, I'm serious. That's what they do, Heather. So at first I thought, oh, well, it's okay. I'm like paying $136 a month. I'm like, yeah, it's not bad. The coverage is pretty good. It's, that alone is like a pretty good deal actually for the coverage that I get from my entire family. It includes 2000 bucks lifetime for orthodontics. And it's like a really good plan. But, and then I was like, oh, wait, I get it all back except for five bucks a month. Nice. Maybe that's insurance for them. Some people just don't claim it back. So well, they I've don't been, end up paying for it. <laughs> I, yeah. I, look, I've been in the reserves for 12 and a half years. And this plan has been available to me the entire time. And I just got on it in July. So <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, I've never seen that before. And I don't want to say anything, but that could be like a shell game that they play. I don't know. Well, it's the government. They, yeah. Isn't that just one big shell game anyway? It's like, <laughs> oh, I'm only paying that much, but I'm paying taxes. So, yeah, I'm just speaking kidding. of taxes. I, and I, I'm not a tax lawyer or an accountant, but is it employees can pay, can claim their share of employee benefit premiums on their taxes under the health and medical expenses category? Can they not? I don't believe so no so no. The, the premiums that the employer is paying are um a tax-free benefit so it's more efficient compared to giving the employee a, a pay raise mm-hmm. so um 
the medical tax credit that the employees portion can be claimed for the medical tax credit, which yeah. isn't as great as what people, most people or no. people think. Um, but, but sometimes yeah. you're like looking at pennies, right. To get over that yeah. threshold or whatever. So yeah. yeah. Sorry. Did I say employer, the employee, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. The employee <laughs> portion. Yes. yes. Can be as a medical tax. Credit. Sorry. <laughs> did I say employer? I might've my apologies. So, but yeah. And the portion that the employee is paying. So Evan, with your $5 per month, that's probably going to pay your life insurance and your, your accidental death and dismemberment or something. So no, that, that's not included. Okay. That is, is literally just a health, just a health plan. Health plan. Okay. But it uh, brings up a good thing there, but Evan, hold that thought. Okay. Life insurance plus accidental death and dismemberment. Nobody knows what accidental death and dismemberment is for on their benefits booklets. Tell us, tell our listeners what that's all about. <laughs> really? Nobody understands that. No. Yeah, I don't know what it's about. I thought that was like the easiest question yeah. ever, but no. <laughs> um, so you don't have to make us feel dumb, Dave. Gee, no, I, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I just kidding. so accidental death is um, well, yeah, it is um, a good question. So accidental death is basically if you're on the white mud and you get in a car accident, that's an accidental death. If you're parachute jumping and the chute doesn't open, that's accidental. But um, truth be told, and I've heard a stat where only 4% of deaths are considered accidental. So hence the reason why that premium is so low. Mm -hmm. And then the dismemberment part is that, do you remember when you're in school and you had like that little chart that said, like, if you lose an arm and a leg, you get paid out, whatever, hundred thousand dollars. I didn't have that chart in school. Okay. It was part of like, maybe I'm too old for that, but there was a chart that had, if you lose an arm and a leg, then you get $50,000. If you lose a leg, then you lose, or you, you get uh, 25,000. If you lose a toe, there's a chart in the benefit booklet that will say what percentage of the AD and D benefit that you get depending on what appendage you lose. Um, so, and once again, it's not that common, hence why the premium is extremely low. So, it, does that cover things like blindness and deafness as well? It, um, yes, it does. Uh, if you lose one eye or if you lose both eyes, there is a formula for that. But um, that's what AD and D is. And do you get AD and D plus life insurance if you die by accident? You do. Yeah. So if you <laughs> if you pass away on the white mud accidentally then you you hit the double whammy and you get the life insurance you get the ad and d so that's the way to do it but like i said it's it's not that common because if they find out that you had a heart attack right before you hit the wall um in your car then it's just the life insurance so harsh yeah that's where it gets a little bit sketchy i saw that look in heather's eye heather that doesn't mean you should start driving recklessly down the white mud <laughs> oh no 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 <laughs> but i'll just say this too when people say like oh i got like really cheap insurance like life insurance that's only two dollars a month you don't have life insurance you have ad and d coverage mm. okay mm. It's so even covers if, yeah. if it's an accident yeah you kind of get what you pay for mm. okay um, I was holding a thought. Can I let it out now? Oh, yeah. So I had this previous question kind of brought up another thing that I thought maybe would be good to touch on because we were talking a little bit about tax consequences of different insurance. And you, we've mentioned a couple of times the, um, the health spending account. Is there, does that have to be set up a certain way in order for that to be provided as a non-taxable benefit to the employees? Or can you just literally say like, yeah, yeah, just send me your receipts and I'll cut you a check? <laughs> Um, yes. So it definitely has to be set up with a third prior third party provider in order for it to be legal. So the employee can definitely, or the employer can't just say, give me your receipts and I'll write it off through my company. Um, so there are a whole gamut of uh, companies that provide this service and, um, their job is to make sure that those expenses are legitimate <laughs> and to make sure that, 
an employee is not submitting a claim for their hot tub, claiming it's for therapeutic purposes, or we've had people where they change the rugs in their, their house and try and send it in through the health spinning account saying that um, they are having allergies with their previous carpet. Mm. And uh, so the third party will make sure that everything is legitimate if that employer ever gets audited. Right. It's still going to fall under that medical expenses category. It can't just be for anything. Like legitimate right. from the CRA's perspective, right? That's what we're worried about. Yeah. I mean, they're pretty, they're pretty lenient as far as what can be claimed. Um, it's a lot more comprehensive compared to a lot of the insurance uh, coverage, but everything from like laser eye surgery, everything you want there to... Yeah, we had a client that went to go get a gastric sleeve. Um, they didn't want to wait here in Alberta, so they went to Ontario where they could get it done right away. Paid $20,000, I believe, for the expense. But not only was the expense covered, but also the hotel rooms, the accommodations, all that was covered with the health spending account. Yeah. Wow, that's a, so, that's a good health spending account. Heather, set one of those things up for me. <laughs> <laughs> I have one for my business, for myself. Oh, nice. And it was for a business owner. So, I mean, yeah, those types of things, it's way more tax efficient. So that's yeah. a better way to do it. Right. Because then, because you're spending the money out of your business, I guess to write it off as a tax, as a taxable expense or non-taxable expense, I should say, um, as like a cost of doing business. And then you doesn't get added to your personal income. Is that right? Right. Correct. Said, yeah. Okay. And there's a fee usually charged by the um, an admin fee by administrator. The... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it works out better in the long run overall, I guess, than paying it out of pocket. And that's one of the things like most business owners don't know about. And I wish that they could wrap their head around it. Like it is such a huge tax efficiency. Like even if you're a, a small company, a husband, wife, as long as you're incorporated, I definitely encourage all uh, business owners to set one of these up because it's a huge tax efficiency and accountants should be mentioning this if they don't have that feature, but uh, it's way more efficient compared yeah. to paying for the expenses with personal after tax dollars. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause it's, it's not insurance. Like let's talk about that for a second. The, the, the spending account, if you don't spend it on a legitimate health expense, which you would probably be getting anyways, then it's not like you're losing money. The money like is just sitting there waiting for you to be used. So it's like, I like the way you put it, that it's a tax efficiency, just makes you more efficient tax wise for avoiding taxes, which is legal as opposed to uh, evading taxes, which is illegal. Yeah. And and there's some providers that don't have an annual fee. So you could go three years and all of a sudden, I don't know, my, my spouse wants to have laser eye surgery. Okay. Awesome. Now we can submit that expense. But for the most part, most people are going to the dentist once a year or they might have glasses, they have some kind of prescription. Hey, I want to go to the massage therapist. They have some kind of health, dental or vision expense that they can run through. So why would you pay for it with personal after-tax dollars when you can run it through the company and write it off through your corporation? And from the employer's perspective of providing to employees, I really like what you said about combining the insurance with the spending account, because then it's like, oh man, this is sweet. It's not covered. I can also spend this much per year. And even if it's just $500 a year, like that's, uh, that can be seen as like a pretty sweet perk of the job, Uh which goes a long way to employer satisfaction, employee satisfaction and, you know, keeping employees. So I bet you that's a pretty underutilized strategy. It is for sure. And, um, the idea is to have a foundation for the catastrophic events where if I get diagnosed with cancer or that $5 million disability claim that you're going to have over the next 20 years, like disability expenses or disability claims, that's the foundation and have the insurance company um, incur that risk. But for the things like vision care, like vision care is very expensive to add on to a group benefit plan. Like that's why you don't see it that often. It's because it's very expensive. So for those types of expenses, have it run through a health spending account um, or the additional expenses that the employee wants to have. So if I want to go to the massage therapist every week and have $2,000 of massage therapy claims, that can also be run through the uh, health spending account as a top up. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. 
That's trying to make everyone flexible. happy. Yeah, yeah. Dave, are there any, um, I guess, things that employees should be looking for in their benefits packages or are there any mistakes or things that employees can be doing wrong? Yeah. Or like any like hidden gems hidden in that fine print that we never read. Um, the biggest, um, headache that you will avoid is making sure to add your dependents within the 30 days of either cohabitation. So if you start living with your common law to make sure to put them on the plan right away. Mm. Um, otherwise then they become a late applicant. So the insurance company is trying to avoid the situation where if I start living with someone and yeah, I'm not going to add them yet. We'll wait until they get diagnosed with diabetes. Then we'll add them on. Um, that's anti-selection. So to make sure to add on your, your partners, or if you have any children, add them, basically as soon as you, <laughs> as soon as you can, probably not the most prioritized thing when you're having a newborn baby, but, uh, to try and get it in 30, within 30 days. Oh, that's a good tip. And then also another common thing that we see is if husband and wife both have an employer that with group benefits, um, one spouse will say, no, I like, I'm already covered with my spouse. I, I don't need group benefits covered. So they will completely opt out of all the benefits with their employer, which is a big no-no because it is possible to waive the health and dental on your plan, but still have coverage with your, your spouse. So in other words, you're still covered for the life insurance, the accidental death and experiment, like the, the core benefits, but you're not covered with health and dental. So if that spouse does lose his coverage, then the, uh, the wife could join on to her plan without being a late applicant. So if, okay. if, if that makes any sense, if you're saying, no, I don't want any benefits at all, then they're going to be a late applicant if they're trying to join the plan in the future. Gotcha. But if you opt in at least to the life insurance and the AD and D, then you You're can good. add the health on later on if you want to. Yeah. And it's super cheap insurance. Like it's usually under 10 bucks or something. And it gives you that flexibility or that peace of mind knowing that you can come on if the spouse loses their coverage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Smart. it's okay. very common, but yeah. Oh, so, uh, oh, sorry. Another real quick thing. Yeah. Um, if there is disability on the plan, or even it does happen with life insurance as well, and it's a smaller group, what will happen is the insurance company will say that we will cover your employees up to, and I'm just picking a number, $2,000 per month of disability benefit. And if the employer is eligible for $3,000 of disability benefit, they're going to be capped at that $2,000. If they want the additional coverage of their eligible $3,000 worth of disability, they will have to go through medical questions in order to prove that. So what often happens is the employee doesn't know, and all of a sudden they get disabled and they're looking at their benefit booklet, awesome, I'm covered 66%, that should be about $3,000, but when they apply and they get their claim, it's only $2,000. So they're not aware that they were supposed to top up above what's called it's a non-evidence maximum is that two thousand dollars so to just make sure that the disability amount that they think they have is what they actually have this is like the most important thing of this podcast today in my view <laughs> nobody knows this nobody fills out the questionnaires mm -hmm. nobody Mm -hmm. Good thing we waited till the end to, to mention mm -hmm. this. I'm just so excited you brought this up because <laughs> employers don't tell their employees about the non-evidence limit. But like if you are an employee starting at a company, you need to rifle through your benefits booklet, look for that non-evidence limit, and look to see if you should be submitting this extra form on your health so you can get the maximum amount of disability if it happens. Like, it's just like, it's, it's massive. This like nugget is massive and nobody does this. And no one okay. says anything either. Well, take it easy, Kim, because if all of our <laughs> listeners start doing it, then the insurance companies will figure that out in a hurry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
but put it in the show notes to make sure we add it yeah. in the teaser so that people will listen through the, ep- the episode so that they can hear about why yeah. they are want to hear a nugget, that, but... a nugget sitting in your <laughs> benefits booklet. Yeah. Listen to Dave. I mean, it's funny, I, like, yeah. As I was explaining that, all I saw in the background was like Kim's like this. <laughs> Nodding her head. <laughs> <laughs> Giving a right arm. Yes. <laughs> financial professionals don't know that like nobody knows this. Like uh, it's just uh-huh. it's unbelievable uh-huh. how what an important thing this could be for your life. And yeah. it could just be so easily missed when you started a company. And it's extremely heartbreaking when you have to tell an employee, by the way, you're only getting that $2,000 because you didn't fill in the medical questions to top it up. And yeah, it's, it's not fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I guess, in defense of employers, often, you know, office managers might not know this, right? If you don't have a dedicated or trained HR person, or maybe your broker isn't as knowledgeable or helpful as Kim and Dave are, uh, maybe they just don't even know what that means and they're not passing the information on to employees. So yeah, this is really important information for employees and employers to know. So every year when we do that renewal process with the owner or the plan administrator, there will be an employee summary that says all the employees, what their disability eligible amount is and what they're actually covered for. So the plan administrator or the owner does know Um, and we'll we'll provide them a template to send to their employees saying, Mm -hmm. hey, Joe, just to let you know, this is what you're currently covered for. If you want to top it up, here's the form to do so. But it's really up to the broker to uh, to inform their their client about that. Mm-hmm, this is mm-hmm. a capital edge feature. I mean, you're not every company is doing <laughs> that, Dave. Not every benefits broker is providing that detail. Like, but that's the thing. Like we're working for the like we're working with the client or with the the small business owner, mm-hmm. and we want to try and avoid those landmines of legal care. Um, uh, issues as far as like the employees are suing the employer. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a huge liability. So mm-hmm. we're trying to avoid that. Mm-hmm. And and so where if people have been listening to this and they're like, man, that Dave guy, he's just, oh, I want to get him in here. <laughs> talk to my company so we can do a, create a proper plan design and sort all this out. Where can they get a hold of you, Dave? Like what's your email address for them to reach you? Uh, so email address is dave at capitaledgefinancial.ca, um, website capitaledgefinancial.com or dot, uh, dot .ca, uh, telephone number 780-761-3343. But yeah, we'd love to work with you guys. So yeah, well, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you thought, look, everybody, I get this asked this all the time. Nobody knows this. It's kind of annoying. I have to say it every single meeting. Right now, uh, and this is definitely a hot topic with COVID and as we discussed uh, pre-recording, travel, travel insurance. I will just say that every insurance company is different. So uh, honestly, talk to or call in the insurance company to find out what the restrictions are. Can I go to Mexico? Can I travel? Am I going to be covered for COVID if I get diagnosed or or what the the details are? But every insurance company is different. So if you're planning to go somewhere anytime soon, check with the insurance company. Yeah. And don't just trust like what one person tells you over the phone either. I wouldn't, to be honest, from the lawyer's perspective, get in writing. And even then, I think I, I'm not hundred percent sure on this, but I seem to think I seem to recall from my insurance law class. So take this with a grain of salt, people that if the insurance you purchase isn't correct. And even though the person told you you were going to get something else, doesn't mean you get what that person told you you're going to get. I think probably the result would be, you might get a return of a return of premiums paid, which it's not going to be great if you're like stuck in Mexico with COVID, not being able to fly home. You're going to want that insurance coverage. So uh, I would just say, just make really, really sure that it's not an off the cuff. Oh yeah, yeah, we cover that. But it's like, no, you, they really, they really do cover what you're wanting them to cover. Exactly. And as you guys know, like when it comes time to, when push comes to shove, it's not what he said or what she said. It comes down to what's in writing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And insurance companies have a lot of lawyers. They have um, contracts. Everything is written for that reason. Yeah. And most of their contracts are going to include a, a special clause that says this is the entire contract. It doesn't matter what was written or agreed elsewhere. This is the entire contract. What's written right here. So yeah. I have a thing that, that I was hoping we could touch on today because we are the legal podcast. So when it comes to divorce and separation, Dave, people are splitting, but they're on a benefits plan. What happens there? What's the timing of getting booted off the plan? So um, if that is the case, the they st- uh, sorry, the uh, parties still have to keep the group benefits even during the separation process um, until the divorce is finalized. So even if the partners are living in separate quarters or whatnot, that partner still has to provide group benefits to his spouse until the divorce is finalized. And we've seen also in a lot of judgments or settlements, the, the ruling will be that the spouse has to provide some kind of health and dental coverage after the divorce is finalized. So you're not just leaving the, the X high and dry as far as, okay, well now you're on your own as far as getting dental coverage or healthcare drug prescriptions. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So if they have a pre-existing condition. Can they, can they go get insurance elsewhere? Is there like a timeline where they need to get it? That's where it gets a little bit more sticky. Um, personal healthcare plans is, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing because personal healthcare plans are good if you're healthy. So if you're able to pass those medical questions, that insurance medical questionnaire, it's not a problem. Um, but the personal healthcare plans in Truth be told, it doesn't matter if it's Blue Cross or Canada Life or Manual Life, the personal plans are very restrictive. So they're a lot more uh, or lower annual limits compared to a group plan. That's how they avoid their anti-selection. So you're not racking up uh, massage therapy claims, but um, they have a lot lower limits. It's harder to get and the premiums are, are not that cheap either. Uh, and what's even worse is the guaranteed issue plan. So when the insurance company says, we guarantee that we'll uh, offer you coverage, or if you're coming off of a group benefit coverage, we'll provide you um, a certain amount as far as coverage, those limits are even lower. So mm-hmm. it might be 100 or $200 in drug coverage. It's very low in the, uh, the limits that they provide. So it's not as comprehensive as a group plan. So better to be on a, a comprehensive group plan because then you can just slide over to your own plan without having to do a medical and get rejected. If you can, yeah. So. And is that like 30 days, 60 days usually? Do you have like a year to put the plan in place? What what does that look like? So for sort of the personal plan? Uh, if you're just like on a plan of some kind and you need to put your own in place, do you have a... a, a timeline that you need to work with so normally it's between 30 and 60 days depending on the carrier um what they'll do is um say for example they'll have a dental waiting period so if i sign up for february the first for my health and dental they're not going to allow you to go get your teeth cleaned on february the first and then have you cancel it the very next month so normally they'll have a three-month waiting period before you're eligible to get your teeth cleaned but if you're coming off of a group benefit plan within 30 or 60 days, they'll waive that three month waiting period. Is just there a, to, oh, sorry. Well, just trying to avoid uh, people abusing the plan. You talked about sort of like whether or not they would have to qualify. Is there a, is that the same kind of time frame that it would, it's usually 30 to 60 days of coming off of a plan? Like if say, you know, the husband had a health issue, wife has a plan, the divorce is granted, he can't be covered anymore because he's a spouse, but wants to move over. Does he have to do that in a certain amount of time before he'd have to provide medical information? Does that question make sense? Does, is that the same timeline? <laughs> I think so. So like anytime you're setting up personal coverage, um, you're going to have to provide some kind of medical questionnaire or information. Oh, okay. um, once again, they don't want you to wait until you're a diabetic before you um, set up that personal plan. So you okay. have to be in good health. Okay. And unfortunately, a lot of times if 
well, if you are on a prescription drug, it doesn't matter if it's a thyroid medication or cholesterol, blood pressure, yeah. they will exclude that as a pre-existing. They'll cover anything else, but anything related to that high blood pressure or condition that you already have. So is that if you move from a comprehensive plan to another comprehensive plan or will you just all like just pre-existing conditions not matter if you're moving from comprehensive to comprehensive in like, like 30 or 60 days? From a group to a personal plan or group to group, group to group. Do you oh. like, do you have any, is there any issue with the medical stuff if you move within 30 or 60 days? No, like if you're going from a group plan to a group plan, then that's not a problem. Like there are no medical questions. But group to personal, there are. Yes. Yeah. Anytime you're setting up your own individual policy where you control that policy or that contract, you're going to have to ask answer medical questions. Okay. Interesting. So, and I'll just say like that is one of the disadvantages of a group plan is that you're at the mercy of that employer. So you don't control it. You don't own it. Um, the contract is between the employer and the insurance company. So if the employer decides, hey, we're we're canceling everything, the employers are left high and dry. So that's the disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So when divorcing, go work for a company that has comprehensive coverage and move your plan within 30 to 60 days. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it was from an insurance perspective, <laughs> don't get a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my takeaway that's so easy i'm sure that's what you tell all your clients evan <laughs> yeah i just tell them yeah. oh you don't want a divorce you're gonna end up paying me a bunch of money wouldn't you rather just keep that money and go on vacation <laughs> they don't if take care of it though yeah is there a good option though if you're an unemployed spouse that doesn't have great health like you're just gonna have to do that and get what you get is that sort of <laughs> what i'm hearing um so once again one of the advantage advantages of working with a broker um mm -hmm. just the knowledge of there is a plan with the uh, alberta government health and wellness mm -hmm. that will cover pre-existing drugs mm -hmm. so if you're on that um Super expensive. Unfortunately, that rheumatoid arthritis drug that I was talking about is not yeah. covered with this plan, but mm. most drugs will be covered with this government program. It's yeah. um, administered by Blue Cross, but it's actually sponsored by the Alberta government. Um, it's not a profit company, but they're there to help those that need prescription drugs right. um, in case they are without group benefits or they're being excluded on their mm -hmm. personal plan. So that's okay. a little hidden gem that's not advertised. No one ever really mentions it, but it is a plan with the Alberta Health and Wellness. Right, right. Yeah, I think this is a really important message for the, you know, those family lawyers that are listening to today's episode, um, because this could be really difficult for some spouses to be left without coverage, right? Um, so if oh, you just yeah. assume, oh, just go get Blue Cross, it'll be fine, <laughs> or yeah. the other spouse will pay for it. I mean, it, what I'm hearing is it just might not be available or it might be really, really expensive. So something to well, think about. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if you've come across, I'm sure you have come across it, Heather, because I've seen it a few times where part of the negotiation is like, yeah, and you're going to leave me on your health plan, mm -hmm. your health benefits. Yeah, yeah. But that's not even often allowed, right? Once the person's well, not a spouse anymore. Right. That's what Dave's saying, right? Is that, uh, so that's important for people to know that just because you may want to stay on the plan, the thing is, if the insurance company finds out that you're not spouses anymore and you've been making these claims, what do you think they're going to do? Especially if like, that ex-spouse is racking a bunch, a bunch of yeah. claims that is counting against that company, then yeah, it's going to be quickly found out. Yeah. And, and the insurance company is not going to be like, okay, you got us. Good one. Yeah. No, it's going to be like, okay, now you owe us this money. And surprisingly that there are um, fraud departments with the insurance companies where they are checking to make sure that everything's legitimate. Cause a lot of times, like say, for example, on your claims, when you're submitting that, that claim for a massage or whatever, like if your massage therapist doesn't have direct billing, um, they're relying on the the honor policy that yeah that was a hundred dollar massage and that i am going to get reimbursed so they do have fraud departments to make sure that people aren't trying to commit insurance fraud right so i will also add with respect to um 
when divorcing, uh, or even if you're leaving a group benefit plan, um, they do allow, the insurance company allows the employee, as well as if there was dependent life insurance, for that person to continue on with that life insurance coverage on their own on a personal policy without any medical questions. So to be more specific, say, for example, I'm an employee, I have um, type 1 diabetes, which is very, it's not a favorable thing for insurance companies, and I'm leaving that employer, I can convert that policy to a personal policy without any medical questions. Mm -hmm. So if I'm declined elsewhere, if I I can't pass medical, um, I can do that. The premiums are quite high, but at least I'll have something when I leave that group benefit plan. And the same applies to um, spouses or even children. If there is dependent life insurance, I can convert that $10,000 small policy into a personal policy without medical questions. It's a good tip. So another little tidbit. Uh (laughs) Because like I said, the, the people that want insurance the most are the ones that can't get it yeah yeah exactly huh okay that's a good one to know too awesome all right well i think i think we've gone the distance here heather is it, did you have any other burning insurance and group benefits and no i'm glad that kim brought up the divorce and separation question because i know pre-podcast we were saying that that was a something that she wanted to get out there for folks to know. Yeah. Yeah, It's a period where people are, there's so much going on and so Mm -hmm. much to sort through, Mm -hmm. but what really comes down to being important, sometimes it's these little things that get forgotten and um, lawyers don't really want to bring up benefits because they don't know the, you know, they don't know the ins and outs of benefits. Like well, talking with Dave today, you can tell that it takes, you know, it takes a long time to learn all of these, these important bits. So Edmonton lawyers just send everybody to Dave. <laughs> yeah. Dave, yeah. Our, like, Dave. Dave, Dave's help line over here. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I totally appreciate because like you said, Kim, there's a lot going on. Um, emotionally, financially, and then all of a sudden you're trying to put in group benefits or health and dental into the equation as well. It's like, well, I don't know. You just assume that you're going to be covered with your your spouse's group benefit plan forever. Mm-hmm. And now what do I do? Mm-hmm. And, and especially if they're not in good health condition, they're going to quickly uh, learn the term pre-existing condition and every door that they knock on, that's what they're going to run across. So yeah. that Alberta health and wellness drug plan is definitely a saving grace for a lot of people. And even if they are in a group benefit plan, um, I've experienced this personally where uh, a chemotherapy drug Nulasta cost about $2,500 for a little thin, like the tiniest injection um, for those going into chemotherapy. And we had to use the Alberta Health and Wellness to help cover some of that cost. So um, it definitely helps. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is... No. (laughs) Well, that's all, that's all gold. And hopefully at least a few folks out there can benefit from some of that knowledge and um, we'll give you a shout if they have any, any questions about any of this. Dave at capital edge financial.ca, right? Awesome. You bet. Nice. But uh, once again, thank you guys for allowing me to share some of this and uh, help you guys out. It's been such a pleasure having you on. Thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. And like, I, I'm truly passionate about helping people and like small business owners are just, I get a great joy from this. So um, anything that I can help out with. Super. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been another episode of Access to Justice. Thanks for listening or watching. However, you found us today. If you have any questions you'd like us to address on the podcast, please send an email to access to justice podcast at gmail.com. That's access the number two justice podcast at gmail.com. And we'll do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Thank you. Bye bye. Any information in this video is general information only and is not, nor is it intended to be, legal advice.
Watching this video does not create a lawyer-client relationship. You should always seek the advice of a lawyer or other qualified professional for advice regarding your individual situation. While we take care to ensure that the information contained in this video is accurate and up-to-date, we make no warranties or representations as to the suitability, completeness, or accuracy of the information contained in this video. Any reliance you place on the information is at your own risk. Kahane Law Office, Merrick Law, Heather Malarick Professional Corporation, Evan Clark Professional Corporation, Evan Clark, Heather Malarick, and any guests will not be responsible nor liable in any way for any content, including but not limited to any errors or omissions in the content, or for any loss or damage of any kind incurred as a result of any content communicated in this video, whether by Evan Clark, Heather Malarick, or by a third party. Kim McDonald is a financial advisor with Raymond James Limited. Information provided is not a solicitation, and although obtained from sources considered reliable, is not guaranteed. The view and opinions contained in this media are those of Kim McDonald, not Raymond James Limited. Securities-related products and services are offered through Raymond James Limited, member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Raymond James advisors are not tax advisors, and we recommend that clients seek independent advice from a professional advisor on tax-related matters. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, RJFE, a subsidiary of Raymond James Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. When providing life insurance products, financial advisors are acting as insurance representatives of RJFE. Darkness of the Dales dissipates, declines.